So hi everyone and welcome to our video uh, on expected utility and the axioms that surround uh, our expected utility assertion which eventually leads into the expected utility theorem. So uh, this is part of our discussion on financial decision making under uncertainty. So if you recall in the last video we, uh, we posited uh, Bernoulli's uh, assumption in that the expected value criterion has a lot of uh, constraints and a lot of limits and it may not be as stable a criterion as we would want it to be when we're evaluating different investment uh, alternatives especially if these investment alternatives are generally uncertain so the we said that there was room for improvement and one of the uh, uh, things uh, Bernoulli posited was this concept called expected utility. And it was formalized uh, by von Neumann and or, uh, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern in 1944, uh, in which they created a mathematical model for examining the economic behavior of individuals, especially under conditions of uncertainty. So in situations involving risk in general, individuals act as if they choose upon the basis of expected utility. So the higher the uh, expected utility, the utility of expected wealth or consumption or whatever, then the higher the expected value. So in our discussions, uh, as we've uh, shown time and time again, we can think of individuals choosing between different probability distributions of wealth, right? We can put some restrictions, such as assumptions of our actions of consumer behavior, which we will, just to ensure that a consumer adheres to some certain properties we believe are important uh, on their particular preferences, uh, just as in the case of, uh, of certainty. But this time, we have to bear in mind that we are dealing with a scenario of uncertainty. So they wouldn't, uh, there would be payoffs that would be uncertain and the consumer would not know all the factors that would be there. Okay, so let's start to discuss the axioms of choice under expected utility. So if an individual's preferences abide by these axioms, we can define an expected utility function over wealth. So essentially we can define the function or the function can sort of exist for as long as we obey these uh, certain axioms of choice. And essentially, you've seen these, uh, these properties before. So we're just gonna express them in terms of this concept called expected utility. So the first is complete ordering or comparability, similar to completeness. Transitivity, similar to transitivity. Measurability and continuity, a little bit of a new one, but this one will be very straightforward. Strong independence, I read it again, a new one, but will be straightforward. And ranking. Okay, so we have these uh, axioms of choice. So we'll discuss each of them in this video. So before we proceed, we need to know uh, about how we can mathematically de denote a particular gamble. So we've said uh, in the St. Petersburg paradox that we have a, uh, that it's essentially a gamble and the gamble has a payoff and the payoff has a certain probability of occurring. So we will try to uh, sort of translate this into a mathematical form which is easy and tractable to understand and it's in shorthand notation so that we can write it over and over again and not need to write the whole paragraph so we let g x y p so this is the gamble g x y p okay so we denote a gamble in this way and g okay the gamble so if the consumer chooses the gamble or, or say it's some lottery, so let the gamble be a lottery that offers, so it could offer a monetary payoff X. So this is monetary payoff, okay, sort of one or payoff X. And the probability that you get that monetary payoff is P. So probability that uh, you get payoff X, right? And then you also have a payoff Y. So in a gamble, right, there are multiple scenarios that would happen. Say, for example, in this particular gamble, there's X, you could get X or you could get Y. And then P would be the probability of you getting X. Therefore, because these, there are just two options in this particular gamble, the probability of you getting Y is essentially one minus P because of course the probabilities have to sum up to one. 
so y has a has a monetary payoff monetary payoff y and the probability associated so prob associated is a uh, uh, one minus p or the uh, everything the probability that is not p okay so uh, that's how we denote the gamble pretty straightforward so obviously uh, it should occur that if you have a gamble say g x y one so it means that p is equal to one therefore outcome x will occur at certainty because the probability that x that you would get x is a hundred so this is a, a gamble wherein the outcome is certainly x, right? It's certainly x. Conversely, you could have, a, so you could denote the gamble g x y p. This is the same as g y, so y being, say now the first option, x being the second. And of course, the probability denotes, uh, the, the probability at the end of the notation is the probability of the first outcome, which in this case is y, so that will be one minus p. So those two outcomes there are, yeah, those two gambles there are equal. Okay, so let's start with our first axiom, which is on comparability or completeness. So for this is this almost the same case as we've had before. For the entire set of outcomes of uncertain alternatives, an individual can say that they prefer x over y, they prefer y over x, or they, they're indifferent between the two payoffs. So that's the first, uh, the first action, pretty straightforward. The second one is, is transitivity. So if I add the third uh, payoff, which is z, if I prefer x to y and I prefer y to z, then it should hold that I should prefer x to z. Similarly, if I'm indifferent between x and y, and indifferent between y and z, I should also be indifferent between x and z. So that's our consistency there. Okay, so it's the same uh, transitivity assumption as before. So now this one is a bit new. It's called strong independence. So what does that mean? Okay, so let's put on this uh, quite quickly. Let's consider two lotteries. So you have two potential lotteries. So you have G, you have a gamble one. Okay, so one, the, sub, the superscript one denotes that it's the first gamble. Okay, or an option of a gamble. So has pay of X, Y, and then pay of X has a probability P. And I have a second gamble where in Y, Z, and then P in this case is the probability of Y, right? Of Y, of you getting pay of Y. Okay, now if X is indifferent to Y, so that means you treat, uh, uh, if you are indifferent between receiving the monetary pay of X, and receiving the monetary payoff of Y, then you are indifferent between these two gambles. Okay, so uh, again, if X is indifferent to Y, i.e. the monetary outcome X, you're indifferent between that monetary outcome and the monetary outcome of Y, given that they have exactly the same probability of occurring, which is this P here, okay, you are indifferent between taking the two gambles. You could take either lottery and not care. Now, if you prefer X over Y, I, you, prefer, you like this more than this, given that the probability of X and Y are the same, that's P, so they have the same probability of occurring, but you prefer X more, then you would prefer the first gamble. So that's a, I think that's a straightforward assumption. Uh, and that's our assumption on strong independence. So. That's the third action. The fourth action is on measurability. And measurability just states that if X is preferred to Y uh, and Y is preferred, uh, if X preferred to Y preferred to, uh, I think this is Z, so sorry. Okay, I, I think this is uh, Z, preferred to Z. Then there exists a unique probability such that y, uh, that y indifferent to the gamble. So uh, let's explain this with this uh, sort of explanation. If I am indifferent between x and y, then I will be, of course, indifferent between these two gambles. So essentially, it's like uh, an extension of our strong independence assumption before. So given that the likelihood of x occurring is p, the likelihood of y occurring is also p, then 
uh, I would be indifferent between the two because I'm indifferent between monetary pay of X and then Y. But if I prefer X to Y, then similarly, uh, it would hold that uh, I would get this. So uh, I would prefer one gamble over the other. So sort of same, sort of same assumption. Next, I have ranking. And in ranking, suppose I have uh, alternative outcomes Y and U, okay, and both lie somewhere between X and Z. Okay, so I have uh, possible outcomes Y and U. So uh, let's write it on Y and then U. And both lie somewhere between X and Z. So maybe X is there and then Z is here. And we can establish gambles such that an individual is indifferent between Y and a gamble between X with a probability P1. Okay, uh, so essentially we have a gamble X, Y, P1. Okay, so we have that gamble. And we also have a gamble while also indifferent between U and a second gamble between X, right? So, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, an individual indifferent between Y and a gamble between X with probability P1 and Z. Okay, and while also indifferent between U and a second gamble between, okay, so the second gamble is, so this is G1, we have G2, which is X, Z, P2, right? So we have that gamble. Now, in order for us to infer anything about these two, okay, so we need to understand the relation. Suppose that I prefer X to Y and I prefer Y to Z and X is preferred to U, which is preferred to Z. So sort of these are two, uh, uh, so we treat this as one and then we treat this as another. Okay, so Y is in the middle and then U is also in the middle, but obviously I know that I prefer X to Z. Okay, so I'm gonna try to infer something about Y and U. So then if Y is indifferent to, and U is indifferent to G, G1 and G2, uh, so say, uh, so I'm indifferent between uh, these two gambles, it follows that if the probability of the first gamble is greater than the second gamble, then you would prefer Y okay, over U. So you would prefer the first monetary payoff, uh, which is the payoff Y, to the payoff in U. However, if the probabilities are equal, so say P1, say P1, and P2 say they are both equal, equal, then you are indifferent between the two. And that makes sense. If P1 is higher as in this case, so this one is higher, then the likelihood of X, okay, uh, the likelihood of X happening is greater than, uh, than the likelihood of X occurring here. But uh, as we said, you prefer uh, X to Y right, you prefer X, Y, and the likelihood of you getting X here in this first gamble is higher, therefore you would prefer uh, a Y preferred to you, given that U lies between both of the gambles and uh, initially you don't know, you cannot infer a relationship between Y and U because they are separate. So that's our ranking assumption. The last one, uh, based on my recall, is non-satiation. And in this assumption, it's the same as before individuals will prefer more to less, more consumption to less consumption. Now, how do individuals rank across various combinations of risky alternatives according to their preferences? So how do they rank according to these combinations? Okay, so we can use the actions of preferences to show how preferences can be mapped into some measurable utility. Okay, so if the six actions are satisfied, uh, then the von Neumann and Morgenstern uh, function can be sort of uh, realized, which is the expected utility function. So uh, for as long as the six axioms are satisfied, the expected uh, utility function can be formulated. And the expected utility, notice, is just like an expected value, except that before, the things here were the monetary payoffs, the different monetary payoffs you could have, which are Z. But now we're going to, since it's expected utility, we're going to substitute that with the payoff plugged into a utility function or substituted to a utility function, which is some function of wealth, right? Because we have to factor in a crucial concept of wealth. Now, which uh, this utility function 
indexes the value of the lottery, so G, X, Y, P, uh, G, X, Z, P rather, where X and Y are the monetary payoffs of the lottery, and P, of course, is obtaining X, so similar lottery form, right? And the utility is the usual utility function, which assigns a number only to certain or sure monetary payoffs. Okay, so we have to do some uh, a little bit of transformation to that. Okay, so we just uh, so uh, we have this function here. Okay, so we're gonna now sort of discuss this concept of the expected utility function. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold off on that for the next video. So. In this video, just to recall, we discussed um, these principles, these axioms of uh, uh, the expected utility, uh, uh, the criterion of expected utility. And we're going to formalize this into the expected utility function as we move on to the next video. So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for your attention.